the book of Proverbs chapter number 30, verse 24 through 28, when you have it, say amen. amen. And it reads, join me if you will, there be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palaces. Can you say amen? amen? Now listen as I read it. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palace. Hmm. Where is he going with that? You got to wait and see, don't you? Perhaps the hint is in the 24th verse. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Mm -hmm. Look at your neighbor and say, great things come in small packages. Uh -huh. Gr great, great things come in small packages. In other words, it doesn't have to be big to be mighty. Just a small vial of nitroglycerin would blow up this entire facility. It doesn't have to be a whole lot to be very effective. Great things come in small packages. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Let's pray while we're standing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the privilege of allowing me the grace to stand behind this sacred desk and preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for this first night of revival and what you're going to do tonight in this place. I pray in the name of the Lord that the Spirit of God would just take up residence in this place move in a supernatural way to do exploits in the midst of your people. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Have your way tonight. Have your way tonight. Just come in and do whatever you want to do. In the name of the Lord, we pray. Somebody who loves him, say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm rather fond of preaching. Uh, it doesn't even have to be me. It can be anybody preaching. I just love to hear good preaching. Good preaching just stirs my soul. It, it, it does something for me. It challenges me. It changes my life. It fortifies me. It anchors me. It gives me uh, the fortitude that I need to withstand the tumultuous winds that come against me from day to day. And, and, and yet, I know that there was a time in the history of this world that there was no preaching. There was no preaching. There was no preaching because there was no Bible. And yet, there was still God before there was a preacher. And there was a God before there was a Bible. And the Bible tells me that the heavens are telling the glory of God. So if all the preachers were to resign, and stop preaching, and all the Bibles were to be burned, the gospel would still be preached through the heavens. That if you are sensitive enough to it, you can walk out in the middle of a star-clustered night and perceive God in the heavens. Many are the sailors who sail the mighty seas and in the midst of the seas begin to recognize the presence of God as the ship was tossed on the boisterous sea. Because even nature gives us hints as to who God is and what he is able to do. 
The first chapter of Romans tells us that God is going to judge the heathens that had no Bible because they failed to recognize the Creator through the creation. That they should have been able to look at nature itself and perceive the greatness of God. In fact, it implies to us that nature is preaching to us if we have an ear to hear what it is saying. We should have looked at how God clothed the lily and recognized his care for us. We should have seen how God took care of the sparrow that fell from the nest and recognized his care of us. We should have been able to perceive the gentility of the Holy Spirit through the dove that lights gently on our shoulder and recognize that God is a gentle spirit. David did it, he was taking care of sheep out in the pastures somewhere in the rocky hills of Jerusalem in the mountainside. And as he walked across the mountainside tending the sheep, he recognized that what he was to the sheep was exactly what God was to him. And he wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This makes me to know that God is preaching whether we have an ear to hear or not, and he is preaching through nature itself. Now make no mistake about it, our God is an awesome God. He's an awesome God. He's able to do, as the Hebrew said, he's awe-spiring. It means that when you get a glimpse of how, how incredible God is, you're awed and inspired all at the same time. He's awe-spiring. Our closest English word would be, he's awesome. He's incredible. We're filled with awe. We, we can't explain him. We can't draw pictures of him. We can't depict him. We're just filled with awe because our God is an awesome God. The Bible says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It could then be possible that God is speaking and we don't always have an ear to hear what God is saying to us. If he doesn't speak it to us in the way that we expect him to speak, perhaps we are missing God on many levels because God is showing up in another form. Several years ago, I had the privilege of going to South Africa for the first time, and it was just a, you don't mind if I take my time tonight, do you? It was just a wonderful uh, experience for me. It was uh, my first time being on the continent of Africa. I was introduced to the country of South Africa and it was just incredible to me. And when I got through preaching and ministering, uh, I was in Johannesburg and they were talking to me about going on a safari. And uh, they asked me, would you like to go on a safari? And, I didn't want them to know that I'd never been on one, so I said, that would be nice. <laughs> in reality, I wasn't exactly sure what a safari was and what was entailed in a safari, but I just played along as if I understood what they were talking about. Being a country boy born in the hills of West Virginia, I was not familiar with safaris, you know. Uh, you might have seen somebody kill a possum every now and then, but. They didn't generally use the term safari to talk about that. Anyway, in South Africa, they talk about uh, a particular group of animals uh, that are in a distinct category all by themselves, and, and they're called the Big Five. And the Big Five basically are comprised of those animals who are at the top of their species. They, there's always something distinctive about them that causes them to be a part of the Big Five. When you talk about the Big Five, you're talking about great and massive, beautiful creatures that, that display some of the handiwork of God himself. I mean, creatures like the lion, I mean, who, who's at the top of his game, or, or, or the elephant, or, or, or the rhino, or the leopard, or, or, or the buffalo. They're, they're, they're distinctive, and they call them the Big Five. And almost everywhere I went, they had uh, pictures of the Big Five. They had drawings of the Big Five. They had uh, ceramic uh, ornaments that, that held the Big Five. There were souvenirs of the Big Five. Of all of the things that could be hunted, uh, these were the most revered and the most awesome and, uh, and often protected species, they were the big five. Everybody wanted to brag about 
capturing the big five. And, and when you think about it, you can understand it. You must, you must understand when you start talking about the lion, the lion is approximately from the tip of his tail to the tip of his nose. He's over nine feet long. He weighs 500 pounds. His teeth are sharp and his roar is mesmerizing. And to capture a lion is the hunter's dream. To, to capture many men would brag about it. And, and there are laws restricting what you can do now with lions. But in, when you could hunt them, it was just awesome for them to talk about, I, I got a lion. And, it, and I, I can't totally relate to this uh, because for me, I would have some real concerns about my gun jamming. I mean, I believe in God and I believe in prayer, but I would, I would have some real struggles. The, 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 the lion walks through the jungle like he's the king and like he's the boss and all of the animals are intimidated or most of the animals are intimidated because of him. But there, but there are some that are not, like the rhino is not intimidated by the lion. The, the, the rhino is not intimidated because he weighs approximately 3.6 metric tons. He's big enough to, to, my mother would say, shade the ground he walks on. Yeah, yeah, I don't know exactly what that meant, but mama said you, when you can shade the ground you walk on, you're not intimidated easily. And, and the rhino had that capacity. The, the sharp horn on the, on the top of his head, if he were to, to bow his head and come after you, he, he was something to be reckoned with. If he didn't get you with his horn, if he got you with his feet, he was just something to be reckoned with. He was in a class all by himself. They're, they are born hairy, but they soon lose their hair because their hides are so strong and so fierce that many animals who would normally intimidate other species do not intimidate the rhino because the rhino is so strong and so awesome and incredible. Or, or let's think about the leopard who is approximately eight feet long and weighs about 250 pounds. The leopard is something, if you ever uh, are, are dealing with a leopard and he starts chasing you, uh, you you're really in trouble because, because the leopard can, can run so fast. He, he, he can do 100 meters in about nine seconds. He, he leaps and before you ever can get in motion, he takes off so rapidly and so fast. You can, you can if you run up the tree, he can climb up a tree tree by his fingernails and sustain 250 pounds by the grip of his fingernails and the trunk of a tree. So even if you could climb up there, you couldn't get to the top of the tree and stick your tongue out at the leopard because he, he's coming to get you. Yeah, he, he's coming to get you. So you have to, you have to think, the buffalo, he, 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 he is not a carnivorous animal, but he is so tough and his hide is so tough and he's so strong that, that those animals who do have sharp teeth and sharp claws are intimidated if you don't kill the buffalo in its youth. Those animals are unable to penetrate his hide and if it were not for man, the buffaloes would still be roaming in mass amounts throughout the world because their skin was so tough and so fierce. And then there's the elephant. There is no mammal that compares to the uh, elephant who's walking the face of the earth. He weighs about 10 tons. He's so strong, he's so tough, he doesn't need a lot of teeth. He's just got so much weight and so much power that a stampede of elephants coming against you would trample down trees and, and every type of animal that got in their path is terrified when the elephant stampedes everything Thing has to get out of his way. His footprints sink holes in the earth because of the massive weight and force that he has. One would think that if God were to express himself through any creature, seeing as God is awesome and so vast and so huge and so mighty and so big, one would think that if God got ready to depict or describe who he was to us, and he would use uh, something big like the elephant or something fast like the leopard or something tough like the rhino or something who had great strength like the buffalo. One would think that God would use the leopard because he was so fast to tell you how quickly he could answer prayer and move mountains and be there. One would think that if God got ready to show you how awesome he was, he would tell you I'm more powerful than the elephant and when I march on your troubles, everything thing is up under my feet. One would think that God would use one of the big five. 
But the reality, the proverbial preacher, when he teaches us that when God gets ready to express himself, should he choose to bypass uh, the seminaries? Uh, 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 should he choose to bypass the great theologians? Should he choose to bypass the great scholars and, and the great orators and the great thinkers and the great authors and the very prolific authors that exist in our contemporary society? That should God choose to express himself through the menial uh, ways of, of talking? Walking through animals, you would think that he would use one of these massive creatures, but, but the writer of Proverbs suggests to us that God is not as concerned about talking to us through the big five as he is speaking to us through the little four. And tonight, when we, when, when we begin to, to, to look at this text, we see a strange paradox that a, a massive God who, who is beyond human comprehension, whose ways are higher than our ways and thoughts are higher than our thoughts, a, a God who we cannot explain nor explore, we've never mastered nor controlled him, that God would bypass all the massive animals, that he would walk through the jungle and walk past the elephant and say, you're big, but, but you won't do. He would walk past the rhino and say, you're tough, but you can't do it. He would walk past the leopard and say, you're fast, but you're not the one. He would walk past the lion and say, you're the king of the jungle, but you're not the one. And keep on walking past the big five, down, 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 down. Down, 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 down. See, see, God doesn't always use who you think he ought to use. God has a way of using the least likely to do the almighty. He, he has a way of showing up in strange places. That's why the Bible says it's not good for us to think more highly of ourselves than we are. Because when we think too highly of ourselves, we are exempt from being a channel of expression for God. God has a way of stepping down. Isn't it funny, men are always trying to go up while God is always coming down. Man is always trying to exalt himself, but God's way is to humble yourself. It, isn't it strange that, that as long as you think yourself small, God will exalt you, but when you think yourself mighty, God will, will humble you. And, and, and just like the big five. That, that everybody wants to capture. There's a, there's a spirit in the church that's disturbing me. It, 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 it bothers me. There's a, there's a Hollywood spirit. There's a... There's a self-promoting, self-engrandizing, political playing, posturing spirit that has come in the church now that the moment people come in the door, they're, they're after the big five. That everybody wants the top of everything. Everybody wants to be acknowledged, have their name called, special seating, special places, special chairs, and special days, and special clothes, and special everything has to be special. But you have to be a little careful about going after the big five. It, it, it seems like you can't hardly get somebody out of the baptism pool before they're going after the big five. In the church, it might be the big five positions like apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists still wet out the baptism pool and they're pastoring a church. Just, just got saved last Friday and they're already an apostle. An apostle and you got 12 members in your church. Apostle over what? Evangelist, no scripture, no teaching, no preparation, no training, but you, you got an evangelistic spirit. What, what it really is is a rebellious spirit, when, when in reality you need to sit down somewhere and let God teach you. Y yeah, yeah, you, you, you need to be taught a little bit. See, it's more to it than knowing God's Word. See, you, you need to know His Word, that's very, very important, but if you're going to survive, you have to know His voice. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying? A lot of people know his word and they don't know his voice. And, 
and many times I've survived the vicissitudes of life, not because I knew the scripture, but because I knew the voice. And sometimes he would speak to me through an unusual way, and I would perceive him speaking through an unsuspected person because God will speak to you through the least likely. He'll speak to you through your kids sometimes. He'll speak to you through a commercial or a roadside. So it's not enough to know his word if you don't know his voice. Somebody throw your hands up and say, teach me your voice. Before I mess up my life, before I make a fool of myself, before I make massive mistakes, before I get into something that I can't get out of, before I set myself back 10 years, teach me your voice, Lord. Teach me how to respond to your voice. Teach me when it's really you and when it's not you. Teach me when to sit down and teach me when to stand up and teach me when to apologize and teach me when to hold my peace and teach me when to lay on the altar. Teach me when to cry out to God. Teach me your voice. Teach me what to worry about and teach me what not to worry about. Teach me when to speak back and teach me when to hold my peace and teach me to perform and teach me to be silent and teach me your voice, Lord. Throw your hands up and say, teach me your voice. My God, I feel something in here tonight. God is going to do something in here tonight. Some of you have been walking with the Lord a long time, but you're just now starting to learn His voice. When you start learning His voice, a lot of things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. You're not easily tricked up anymore because things you used to react to, you don't react to them anymore because you say, that's not him, that's not him, that's not him, that's him right there. Teach me your voice, Lord. Throw your hand up and say, teach me your voice. Mm. Teach me when it is you. Teach me when it's not you. Teach me when you want me to move forward. Teach me when you want me to hold my peace. Oh, it's wonderful to have knowledge, but give me some wisdom. <laughs> see, see, knowledge may give me the tools, but wisdom tells me when to use it. Uh, you can have all the equipment, but if you don't know when to use what God gave you, you'll mess yourself up. And, and, and the big five may have the knowledge, but the little four have the wisdom. The Bible said there are four little things, and though they be little, they are very wise. Now, when a fool calls someone wise, we are not moved. Because when a fool calls someone wise, a fool is easily impressed. I've seen a lot of people call people smart that I didn't think was smart. I've seen a lot of people call certain types of preaching great preaching, and I didn't think it was great preaching. In fact, in my own life, there have been those that I heard and I thought they were great preachers at one stage in my life, and I heard them later and thought, who changed? You'll get it later. But when God says you're wise, can you imagine? all the sages of the ages and all the theologians and all the scholars waiting around when God opens his mouth and says, I'm going to show you what's really wise. And they say, <laughs> he's coming to me. And he walked past every one of them and said to the church, I want you to learn your wisdom from four little things. Four little things. If you want to be wise, God said, I'm going to give you a message through four little things. Don't underestimate them because they're little. Because great things. Come in small packages. And if you can harness the wisdom of these four small elements, 
it will take you through the rest of your life. He walked past the elephant and past the rhino and past the leopard. He walked right on down past the big five. He ran past the cheetah. He went past the eagle. He walked past the hulk. He came down past the wolf. He went past the hyena. He walked past the fox. He walked past the rabbit. He moved past the squirrel. He moved past the beetle, the bug, and the hummingbird. And he came down to a sandy hill with a hole in the center of it and there he pointed at an ant. And he says, if you can garner the wisdom from this, I'm going to give you four things. I'm going to give you four messages in these four little things that if you can receive it, it will change your life. He said, watch the ant and he, and he points to an ant and he shows us an ant who is preparing food for winter and he's doing it in the summer It is in the summer when the grass is green and the harvest is plenteous and everything is blooming and blossoming and there's a wide selection of fruit to be had. It is during that season that the ant ignores where he is because he is filled with preparation for where he's going. And so he does something that seems foolish at the time that he's doing it, but he does it because he has in his mind a place that he's going to. And, and the ant, if he were here to run this revival tonight, his message would be point number one, prepare yourself. The Lord sent me out here tonight to tell somebody, I do not know who you are and it doesn't matter, prepare yourself. God said, listen at the wisdom of the ant, prepare yourself. Notice what the ant does, he prepares for the winter while it is still summer. Let's take this, this action apart because what the Bible tells us is not only what he does, but when he does it. The ant totally disregards what has happened in his past. He is not dealing with the issues of his past. He has come to a point of closure about yesterday. He is not rehearsing the same troubles of his past, repeating the same mistakes over and over again. He has closed that chapter in his life. It is a blessing when you finally get to the point in your life that you can dismiss where you came from and say, that is over. Many of us are foolish because we are 30 years old, still crying about something that happened when we were 12. We're 40 years old and still worried about somebody who left us when we were 30. We're 45 years old and we're still whining about a mistake we made when we were 22. And you'll never be wise when you're working backwards. Watch that ad. He's not working backwards. But the other thing that's amazing about him is not only does he disregard his past, he ignores his present. You do not see the ant trying to greedy up all the food he can while he can and fatten himself up as if there were no tomorrow. The ant has the ability to have delayed gratification. He's willing to wait. You cannot prepare yourself if you don't have the patience to wait. If you can't wait, you're going to mess yourself up from what God has for you. The ant has a strategy. He's acting like a boy scout. His whole philosophy is to get ready for what is about to happen in his life. 
many, many years ago when God brought me out the hills of West Virginia and gave me a national platform, one of the things that I said that catapulted me into the public eye was simply two words. They were two words that I said over and over and over and over again until everybody says them now, and it was, get ready, 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 get ready. I think people got so excited about how I said it that they didn't listen at what I said. The word of the Lord to you is to prepare yourself. Look your neighbor in the face and say, prepare yourself. Look at the ant, my brothers and sisters. Look at the ant, my brothers and sisters. The ant ignores the summer, preparing for the winter. He is taking the food of his summer and moving it toward his winter. He has enough faith to believe that he will be there in the winter. He is not intimidated by any of his enemies in the summer. He has got enemies, he's got assailants, he's got adversities, but he does not believe that any of his natural predators will be able to stop him from getting to the next level. He so disregards his enemies that he's so busy working on where he's going that he doesn't have time to worry about where he is. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm busy. I, I, I don't have time to worry about what somebody's trying to do right now. I don't believe that anything that they're trying to do right now is going to stop me from getting to the next level. I've got to get ready for where God is about to take me, and I don't have time to play. I must prepare myself. I can't wait on you to prepare me. I can't wait on the preacher to prepare me. I can't wait on a husband to prepare me. I can't wait on somebody to discover me and prepare me. I must prepare myself. You don't see the ant sitting back like the queen bee sending somebody else to get his food. But the ant said, if I'm going to eat it, I got to go get it. I'm going to prepare myself. I want to talk to you tonight. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, bring it in yourself. God said, I've got something out there for you that's going to sustain you in your latter day, but you got to bring it in yourself. Your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, neither have entered into your heart the thing that I have prepared for them that love it, but it's been revealed unto us by Spirit. But in order to get it, you got to bring it in yourself. Now the word prepare. The prefix on the word pair, prefix dealing with when you do it, pair dealing with what you do. Pair, to, to pair like, like, your, like our mothers had a paring knife. It, it was cut, you, it meant it was so sharp you could cut it to the continuity of whatever it was you were trying to peel. And it was designed so that you could pair and prepare the food ahead of time and get it in place. Prepare beings to get it ready in advance. I want to talk to somebody tonight because if you're going to obey the wisdom of the ant, you've got to be willing to look like a fool. You've got to be busy getting ready for something that you don't need right now. You've got to be out of step with your situation right now, but in step with your destiny so that you are reacting to something that hasn't happened yet rather than responding to something that's going on right now. Help me, Lord, to preach your word. The Lord said to me when he gave me this message, he said, tell my people that they are ungodly. They are ungodly, not just because of moral issues and not just because of morality. They are ungodly in that they are not like me. I said, Lord, what do you mean they're not like you? God said, I do not react. I don't let the enemy do something and then I figure out what I'm going to do. Because when the enemy move, makes the first move, it means he's in charge. The enemy has never made a move that God reacted to. Because if God reacted, then the enemy would be in charge. God acts. 
He's sovereign. He does what he does. It's the enemy that's trying to catch up with what God is doing. Remember when the enemy came walking through the cool of the garden in the form of a serpent to seduce Eve and seduced her and beguiled her into partaking the forbidden fruit. And she turned and gave it to the man and the man did eat. It wasn't like God jumped up and said, what in the world am I going to do? If you read your Bible, you will know that the enemy did something in time that God had already resolved in eternity. For the Bible said that the lamb was slain from the foundations of the world so that by the time the enemy had done some, God said, I already got something for what you're trying to do. Your God is a sovereign God. God has already got a way of escape for anything you will ever face. He has never been taken by surprise. Can I go deeper? There is nothing about you that has ever surprised God. You may have surprised yourself. You may have surprised your friends. You may have surprised your mama. You may have surprised your co-workers. You may have disappointed yourself, but you have not shocked God. God already knew everything you were going to do before you ever did it. That's why I love being saved, because if God saved me, he already has considered my past, my present, and my future. If God said, I'm accepted in the beloved, then, oh, oh, oh. God said, tell my people I want them to get like me. I want them to stop reacting to situations that the enemy does. I want them to stop dealing with the issues of their past, nor responding to the issues of their present, but I want them to start focusing on where I told you I was going to take you. I don't know who you are, but there's somebody supposed to be here tonight that God has already told you some things he was going to do in your life. You don't have time to deal with your past, nor confront your enemies in your present. God said, pre for the next level. Touch your neighbor and say, I got to go. I got to go to the next level. I got to start getting ready for what God is about to do in my life. Won't be unto me if God puts me on a platform that I'm not prepared for. I've got to be ready now for what's about to happen next. Is there anybody in here who's been feeling like you had to get ready? And you didn't even understand there's been an urgency down in your spirit that you couldn't even figure out. Something in you, has, you're running on all the burners and something is pushing you and you keep saying, I got to, get, I got to, I got to, I got to hurry up. It's because God is about to take you into another level of glory. And yes, you might look like a fool right now, but go ahead and look like a fool. See, this, the ant has wisdom for the person who is willing to grab something bigger than you. The ant doesn't go out and grab a crumb he can handle. The ant will get a piece of bread that's three times bigger than he is. It'll be so big that he's got to back it up and drag it to get it where he's trying to go. Anything else would have let it go and said, I can't get it back. Some of you have been operating like the ant. You got a hold of something, you can't hardly carry it. It's so big, you look like a fool, but you have been busy trying to reel it in. And the Lord told me to tell you, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. My God, I feel like something's about to happen in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Slap somebody and tell them, prepare yourself. If you gotta hold something real big, touch your neighbor and say, it's big, but I'm gonna drag it in. My vision is bigger than I am. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough help. I don't have enough experience, but I'm going to drag that sucker in. I may have to back up and snatch it a little bit, but I'm going to drag it in. I'm not going to stop till I get it in. (laughs) 
Pinch your neighbor and tell him, sink your teeth into it. Sink your teeth into it. Drag it on in. Drag it on in. Back up and pull and push and tug and sweat. Get in front of it and butt it with your head. But get it back to the place because after this, your eyes haven't seen, your ears haven't heard what God is about to do in your life. Look at your neighbor and say, great things come in small packages. Look at them and say, I don't have enough, but I'm going to bring it in. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough experience. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough support, but I'm going to bring it in. I may look like a fool, but I'm going to bring it in. I may have to get out of character, but I'm going to bring it in. I may have to stretch myself, but I'm going to bring it in. I may have to tug and pull and cry and lay hands on my own head, rebuke the devil. I may have to go back to school, take night classes, get a second job, but I, I'm going to bring it in. Number two, please sit down. Number two. The second morsel of wisdom is in the mouth of the conies. It is in the mouth of the conies. And when the Bible starts telling us about the conies, it says that the cony, though they be feeble folk, they place themselves in the rocks. Now you must understand that the, that the coney is just a little bit bigger than a rodent. He's somewhat kin to the rabbit. But the rabbit is fast. And the rabbit is able to survive because he can run fast. But the problem with the coney is he can't run. He almost looks like the mole, but the mole survives because he can dig deep. But the problem with the coney, he can't dig deep. For the coney's hind legs are feeble. <laughs> and so when trouble comes, he can't outrun it because he's got a handicap. And if he had to run, the enemy would devour him. And when he tries to dig, his teeth are not sharp enough and his claws are not fast enough to dig a hole like the mole to outrun the enemy. And so what the coney does, in order to survive the jungle he lives in, so that he can get in a place that, that, that no weapon formed against him will be able to prosper. The Bible says that the coney positions himself so the Lord told me to tell you, number two, position yourself. Who am I preaching to? Some of you have been walking around in the jungle feeling sorry for yourself. And you said, Lord, I can't survive in this situation because I got a weakness. Lord, I can't survive because I started too late. If I'd have got saved sooner, I'd have been further. If I'd have started, if I knew then what I know now, I'd have been all right. Lord, I got a handicap. I got two kids and no help. Lord, I got a handicap. I didn't finish my degree. Lord, I got a handicap. I got a personality disorder. Lord, I got a handicap. And the Lord sent me to tell you everything got a handicap. And if you're going to survive, you got to position yourself. You see, the coney has a handicap, but he positions himself in a position of strength. He backs himself up and positions himself in the rocks. And the Lord said, for where he's getting ready to take you, you're going to have to move into a new position. You're too low for what you got to do. You got to get up in the cleft of the rock. In, in fact, in the Hebrew, the name for the coney literally means to hide yourself. And the Lord said that he's getting ready to send a wave of glory over your life and you're going to have to hide yourself. You're going to have to reposition yourself. This is going to be a year that people are not going to understand you because they're used to you hanging with them. But if you will listen at the coney, you're going to have to reposition yourself. Touch three people and tell them I'm getting ready to reposition myself.
Don't, don't get mad. Don't get upset. Don't, don't get an attitude. But, but I'm getting ready to break out of some circles and break out of some barriers. I'm getting ready to reposition myself for what God's getting ready to do in my life. I got to get out of the weak places. I got to get into the strong places. I got to position myself. I got to reposture myself. I'm too low to do what God has called me to do. And so the Kona. My God, yes, Lord. While I'm preaching to you, he's preaching to me. He said, I want you to stop and take a minute. And I want you to release my people in the spirit for a change. All of you that need to reposition yourself, throw your hands up. In the name of Jesus, I command a release to occur in your spirit. I break the bands of guilt that have held you down and made you feel like you had to stay in the same place to please people. I command the enemy in the name of Jesus to take his hands off of your thinking and I command you to position yourself in a place of strength. Turn around in a circle right now. God's getting ready to change things, circumstances, conditions, places, realign, reorder. You're getting a tune-up. You're going through a transition. You're going through a realignment. God's getting ready to reposition you. Give God a praise. excuses. Lord, I can't do it because of this. And I can't do it because of that. And I can't do it because of the other. And I can't do it. And I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have the other. I don't have the resources. I don't have the strength. I don't have the time. I don't have the talent. The devil is a lie. Anybody who ever did anything for God had a limitation. Jacob had a limp, but God still used him. The apostle Paul was almost blind, but God still used him. Thomas was full of doubt and fear, but God still used it. God said, I can use your limp if you'll position yourself in a place of strength. God said he has a place where you can hide and the enemy can't do you any harm. Look at your neighbor and say, hide yourself. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Look at your neighbor and tell him, get ready to hide myself. God's getting ready to take me to the next level. I got to hide myself. God's getting ready to bless me so I got to hide myself. So many enemies all around me. I got to hide myself. The storms are raging all around me. I got to hide myself. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself. Number three. Before you write down number three, just whisper in your neighbor's ear, tell him he can't see you. He can't see you. Your enemy can't see you.
Somebody ought to thank God for hiding you in the rocks. Hiding in the rock. You know my weakness. You know my trials. You know my tests. You know my tribulation. Hide me in the rock. Hide me. Hide me. Hide me, Lord. Hide me, Lord. That's why they had to kill you. They can't see you. Let me preach on, sit down, sit down. Let me preach on, let me preach on, let me preach on. Wait a minute. The Lord just spoke to me. He said, if you knew the level of the enemy that had been after them, you'd stop a minute and let them praise me for how I hit them. Go on and give them a praise. Ah! But touch seven people and tell them, he hid me. He hid me. He hid me. He hid me. The Lord hid me. The Lord hid me. They were trying to kill me, but the Lord hid me. They were trying to destroy me, but the Lord hid me. They were after my mind, but the Lord hid me. They tried to devour me, but the Lord hid me. They tried to fight me, but the Lord hid me. They tried to attack me, but the Lord hid me. They tried to beat me, but the Lord... Some of you are not shouting for you, but you're shouting for your child. The Lord hid your child. The Lord hid your child. If you hadn't hid your child, the child would have been dead. If you hadn't hid your child, your child would have been swallowed up. If the Lord hadn't hid your child, you'd have been at a funeral. But the Lord, the Lord, the Lord.
the thing that got me when I read about the conies the Bible says that the conies place themselves in the rock though they be feeble folk And one moment he's talking about conies, and then the next minute he calls them feeble folk. How many of you know that God takes feeble folk and hides them in positions of strength? He puts extra support around them. When you got a bad leg, they don't put the brace on the good leg. They put the brace on the feeble place. And God said he's going to use some feeble folk. But he's going to put braces on you. And if you look at the cone, it can't even move good. Because it's so feeble. And it can't even move fast because it's so feeble. But God said, I already got that covered. God said, I got a place I'm going to put you. And when I set you in that place, I'm going to hide you. Because you see, feeble folk praise God differently than other folk. See, other folk don't have praise God because they have a, they have a feeling of entitlement. They think they were supposed to be there. But the conies know that if it hadn't have been for the Lord, they would have been completely swallowed up. They could not run the enemy. They could not dig the enemy. And yet they survived. So the Conies keep saying, if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side, I would have been swallowed up. But thanks be unto God who gives me the victory. Great things come in small packages. There's an anointing in this place right now. I'm not going to override it. I'm not going to overlook it. I'm going to let it work. I told God when I was praying for this revival, I said, I don't want to plan anything. I don't want me to get in your way. I don't even have to preach God. Just bless your people. Bless your people, Lord. Heal your people. Deliver your people, God. Set your people free. Stir up our praise. Stir up our worship. Break the bands from around our neck. Stir up the gifts that lie within us. Quicken our spirits. Renew our mind. We're hungry. Is there anybody hungry? For a move of God in your life and in your spirit, I'm hungry! Ooh. I want some, some blessed people, some hungry people to just raise your hands and begin to worship God. God's going to reposition you. He's going to reposition you. You haven't always been in the best place to work for God. You haven't been in the best place. Sometimes it hadn't been a good place for you. You just haven't been in a good place. People needed things from you, but you wasn't in a good place. People wanted you to be something for them, but you, you wasn't in a good place yourself. And it's hard to help people when you're not in a good place yourself. Lord, I'm trying to be faithful, but I'm not in a good place myself. Position me. Position me, Lord. I'm ready to receive what you have for me, but position me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't outrun this. I can't outdig this. Position me. Mm -hmm. I feel
still praise. Adoration, it's all in the balcony. Somebody's lost in the presence of God. Something broke open in your spirit and you need to let that worship go right now. You need to release it out of your spirit right now and let God move through you. God's giving you a tune-up right now. He's realigning you right now. You haven't been firing on all your pistons. You've been short-circuiting. Your temper's been out of whack. Your moods have been out of whack. But God's, God's aligning you right now. Touch me, Jesus. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel his anointing moving around this place right now. My God, I feel the anointing of God in this place. Have your way, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm not my shot. Oh, I wish I had some real worshipers. Oh, yeah. Have your way, Jesus. Throw your hands up, tell him, I need you, Lord. I can't do this without you. I can't make it without you. I can't bring it in without you. I can't survive without you. I won't be ready for the winter without you. <laughs> I can't position myself without you. Get in my plans and in my thoughts and in my goals and take over my life. Lord, I want your touch. Have your way in me, Jesus. Oh, Lord. <laughs> ah, yeah. Touch your people, Lord. 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 Let your anointing fall on your people, Lord. Strengthen your sons and your daughters. My God, be glorified in his life today. Hallelujah! Oh! Yes, Lord. Touch your people, Lord. Touch your people. Touch your people. Touch your people. Touch your people. We're hungry for you. We're hungry for you. We need your touch. Come on and worship him. The anointing of God is in this place. The anointing is here. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. I'm hungry for you, Lord. Be glorified. No, 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 like never before, quench the thirsting in his soul. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on him. Hallelujah! Fall on him now. Right now. Thank you. Let the praise of God ring out of your mouth. Begin to bless his name right now. The anointing is here. The anointing of God is here. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, hallelujah. Yes. 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 Somebody begin to worship him right now. Somebody begin to worship him right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Have your way, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. My God, I bless your name. Somebody give him glory right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. 